All right, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, kind of two things at the same time. Uh, first, I want to tell you about how we rebuilt our engineering organization for continuous deployment. And at the same time, I want to tell you about how we did it with Garrett and Jenkins and what that looks like and what that actually means. Some of you may not know me. I would gamble, actually, a lot of you don't know me. Um, my involvement within the Jenkins community is from a sort of non-Java perspective. If you've ever spoken with Jenkins CI on Twitter, you're usually talking with me. Um, I also manage a lot of the Jenkins infrastructure with Puppet and occasionally help organize project meetings, conferences, things like that. By day, I work for a company called Lookout. Um, a lot of what we do, I, if you're an Android user, you might already know about what we do. If you're not, we do mobile security and have a pretty full-featured Android application that, that you would be using. But my primary job at Lookout involves hacking with Ruby. And while we have this Android application that gets deployed down to the device, the majority of what we actually do at Lookout is primarily written in Ruby with a, a sort of large server backend where we do things like notifications, backups, analysis, and things like that. And with this entire backend written in Ruby that we would deploy out into the data center, a lot of this can, um, can benefit from continuous deployment. Also referred to sometimes as continuous delivery, there's some sort of uh, semantic differences between the two. And they're very, very similar, but for the context of this talk, I'm going to speaking, be speaking just towards continuous deployment and what it means at Lookout. Before I, I explain too much about what continuous deployment is, I'd like to explain what it definitely is not. Above all else, it is not something that you and your organization are going to do once, check a continuous deployment box, and then you're done, and you can say you do continuous deployment. Like a lot of other uh, workflows or, or methodologies, it's an ongoing process, of, typically of continuous improvement as well. Continuous deployment doesn't mean you release everything as soon as it's committed or that you must deploy to production for every single commit. It also doesn't mean that you don't need a QA team. Um, one of the interesting things I've discovered at Lookout and at some other organizations where I've helped uh, install or help enable continuous deployment is that it frees up the QA team to actually do what I would consider is their jobs. Good QA engineers that I've worked for or worked with have been most useful and most effective for the organization when they're experimenting and exploring and trying to find out new bugs that haven't been found before. And having QA engineers focus on running through slow, boring, kind of tedious test plans is expensive and unnecessary. And it's really something that should be automated. Lastly, I don't think continuous deployment means your users become your beta testers. I mean, there are going to be issues that get out into production, but part of continuous deployment and this sort of constant process of improving what you do means that you should be striving to reduce as many bugs that get into production as possible. To me, continuous deployment is all about stability. It's about being able to deploy changes rapidly and with more confidence than you could before. In order to make that happen, I think it's important that you have at least two fundamentals in the organization. First, a well thought out procedure for rapidly deploying code. This is, I mean, this should be a no brainer if you're going to be deploying, say, multiple times a day. You better have that uh, quick and easy. Secondly, having a good feedback loop from production is also a very important uh, aspect of continuous deployment. If you have one without the other, you might know that issues exist in production and you just know that you're going to have to let the support team know that they've got problems to deal with until you can get a new code release out. If you can get stuff out early or sooner, but you can't know what's going on in production, you might ship bugs for days before you ever find out what's actually going on in, uh, in production with your users. In my opinion, above anything else I'm going to talk about, these two concepts are the most important to, to focus on with continuous deployment. And whether you actually get towards the, the sort of Netflix or Amazon or this sort of continuous deployment nirvana, continuous deployment can still be good for your organization, even if you don't end up deploying every single day. That, that, that process of striving for continuous deployment and improving 
uh, various aspects of your development and deployment pipeline is going to help a lot of other things that go on within the business. So that's all well and good. Yay, continuous deployment. I think I said it 20, 30 times. Uh, let's, let's get back to what this actually means at Lookout. Where we were when we started out in this process in the, in the olden days was using subversion branches for all of our releases. Whenever we were going to do a release, we'd cut a, a release branch and we'd start working on that for about 10 to 18 days. That means we would actually, we'd get about two weeks through something before we could actually get it out into production. So if you told me you wanted to get a release out, I'd say, great, we'll get it out in a couple weeks, maybe. We'll see what happens. We also did a lot of manual code review. The code review process when I joined the company was pretty much you know, saying, hey, come over here and you want to check this out real quick, and then I'll commit it, and hopefully it works out fine. Um, this sort of loosely enforced manual code re review process went in quite well with our kind of culture of very little automation. We actually had some automated tests running that I, I, when I joined the company, I wasn't aware of until about two months after I joined. And there just wasn't this sort of culture around automating anything and any, everything that could be automated. And being a huge fan of, of Jenkins and at the time continuous deployment, this made me pretty sad and really frustrated with the, the state of affairs when I joined Lookout Engineering. But, you know, emotions being one thing, we actually dug up some hard data to, to back up this, this sad kitty. 36% of our deployments would actually fail. And this means around a third of the time, we would try to deploy code, notice that something was wrong in production, have to roll it back, have to try to figure out what went wrong. And unfortunately, since it took us two or more weeks to get a release out, we had almost 70 commits for every single deployment. And this was when our team was maybe eight people. We, we've now, I think we're 150% bigger. And so we needed to fix this pretty quickly. After we would have you know, a failed deployment and roll things back, we'd have to sift through all of these commits and find the bug, fix it, and then redeploy. And because of this, we had around 62% of our deployments would slip their intended release date. As an engineering organization, we couldn't tell the, the CEO or the product owners or anything when something would get out with any sort of certainty because we would just be guessing as well as they could. And this, this causes a really interesting sort of culture within the company to where people start to lose their, their sort of confidence in engineering's ability to get things done. So I was pretty frustrated with this. Um, and as, a, as we sat around some of our, and, and excuse me, as we sat around some of the, uh, the kegerators in the office and discussed what we were going to do, I found out that a lot of other engineers were just as frustrated as I was. So we decided to set out on, on fixing this and kind of resetting how we did things as an engineering organization. And I, I should remind you all that we start, what's this, uh, September? We've been doing this for nine months now. We actually changed this within the last calendar year and have already seen just tremendous improvements. The first thing we really needed to do was automate the development process. For developers, there wasn't any automatic code review, not a lot of automatic test running, not a lot going on. So we started to throw in Jenkins to the mix. Before we used Jenkins, we actually used a tool called Bitten, which I'm not going to talk too much about what Bitten is. Um, there's no Bitten user conference. It's not a very good tool. Um, don't ever use it. Um, but we had practically zero developer feedback. Like, I didn't know for, for a month or two a, until after I, or after I joined that this thing even exists or that tests were actually being run. So developers didn't know. And all of the tests would run on one single machine that was handcrafted by the operations team. So not only, not only, couldn't, or not only could developers not find out that their tests were running, if we wanted to scale that out, we really couldn't. So we installed Jenkins and we started to move things over bit by bit. And as we started running tests in Jenkins, we, we had this sort of starting, startling realization that a lot of our tests actually didn't pass. 
And when we would do these things locally on our machines, we'd blow away the database if something didn't pass, we'd flush cache, we'd, we'd kind of do all these things to get the green to, to kind of tell ourselves that things were good. But when we ran things in CI, we found out consistently there were some tests that were either bad, out of date, or they were just really bad tests. Previously, this was all hidden from us, but once we installed Jenkins, developers were getting harassed on IRC, getting emails, things like that, and so we started to, uh, to improve that. And as we started to go through things, we found out that, that automation, at least at Lookout, needed to become a mindset. We needed to start isolating and identifying different processes that could be automated and should be automated. And if you're in this culture of constantly recognizing that anything a human does you know, two or three times should be automated, then all of those tiny little investments add up over time and you start to have these, these automated, automated pipelines come together over time. So once we had some of that, uh, that automation in place, we needed to focus on building out better tools and better processes than what we were using before. At the time, we were using uh, Pivotal Tracker, which I know they're here, so I don't want to say anything bad about them, um, but it wasn't right for what we needed to do. But we also used Subversion, and I don't really like Subversion all that much, so I'm not going to rant against it. If you like it, that's fine. There are ways to do everything I'm talking about with the exception of using Garrett with Subversion, but we, we viewed it as one of the things standing in our way to, to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. So we dumped Subversion and went for Git. And if you're not familiar with Git, it can be used in a number of different ways. There's sort of the familiar centralized workflow, which is, I mean, that's pretty much what you would know and expect from Subversion. It's really common in smaller companies. There's the integration manager workflow, which is a lot more common in, in GitHub-based projects where there's like one guy you send the pull request to and merges things together. Then there's this really complicated lieutenant's workflow, which is actually how the Linux kernel itself is developed, where you have these lieutenants along who are responsible for different subsystems and they collect patches and they push those up to Linus. And it's, it's a slow and, and sort of complex process, but for a tree as large as the Linux kernel, it, it makes a lot of sense. We went for something different. We went for a combination of Git and Garrett. So I, I, I suppose I might as well introduce Garrett. Uh, some of you might have, have saw the OpenStack talk earlier, so I've seen this to a certain extent. But at heart, Garrett is a code review tool. Like, you push your patches up to Garrett, you can comment on them, and you can work with other people in the organization on kind of fleshing out what looks like good code and what looks like bad code. And as a workflow, what this means for the individual developer is that they always iterate and push code into Garrett. So they'll be pushing code, adding reviewers, kind of getting feedback on what good code looks like. And once the, everything is all well and good, then someone can go ahead and approve and submit that into the main repository. This is nice. A code review is a good thing to do, but it wasn't enough for us. So we added in. Jenkins and the notion of pretested commits, validated merges, gating trunk. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you could uh, refer to this sort of thing. And the whole concept behind this, at least in our Garrett workflow, is that every commit that would come through would need a plus two from a person to say that, you know, at, a, at an eyeball glance, this looks like it's good. And then we also needed all of our tests to, uh, to pass. So we shouldn't ever let any regressions through with this sort of workflow. To accomplish this, we use the Garrett trigger plugin. And I'm actually really interested to look into this Zool thing that the OpenStack guys are using. But for us, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of the Garrett trigger plugin. It uses the same thing that Zool uses with the SSH streamed events API. And it opens up a long running connection to trigger events in Jenkins starting jobs based on whatever patch information or, ch or change information is coming off of the wire. And then once it's spun up all those jobs, it uses that same SSH API to report back into Jenkins. The feedback in Garrett's pretty straightforward. You, you get a minus one uh, in our case, which means that this change, if Jenkins hasn't approved this change, there is no possible way for it to be merged. And this is pretty important for us because it's really tempting if you're late at night and you've got deadlines to say, I'll address these tests later. But we, we don't allow for that. The tests have to pass for us to get anything into the golden version of the repository. 
And so the cycle for developers is work, 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 submit to Garrett, Jenkins will run, some of their colleagues will approve the change or reject the change. They might continue to do some work, everything passes, someone signs off on it, then it gets pulled into the, the upstream repository, and then we go forward with it. So I figured we'd do a demo, and I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to try to do a live demo, so I recorded this. I'll just try to narrate. I'm actually going to break this test, um, not something I recommend. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and make a commit that breaks this test. Um, let's see if I can. I'm typing very slow for my screencast. And the way that Garrett works is it actually acts as a Git repository. So I'm going to push directly to Garrett. And Git knows how to deal with native Git objects using a library called JGit. And you'll notice that my commit is up there in my code review panel. And I can go in and I can see the commit message, the commit hash. And I can see that Jenkins has already failed this. And it looks like we're, we're off to the left, my mistake. Um, and with the Garrett trigger plugin, it's going to report into Garrett with the link to any of the jobs that ran triggered off of this change. We can see here that is a normal sort of um, Jenkins job, and I've got a test failure here because I intentionally broke my test, being a great developer. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and leave a comment on here. Um, it's a little off to the side. It was something snarky, I'm sure. So as, as a developer, I know that I've got this failure, and I need to go back and fix this. So I'm going to jump back into that test, remove the test failure again, and leave a little comment to remind myself that I shouldn't be breaking this test. Um, and then what I'm going to do is, instead of submitting another commit, I'm actually going to create a, a sort of fix-up commit and use git rebase to squash that up into the previous commit. And this is important in the Garrett workflow because it allows you to iterate on a single change in Garrett. So Garrett doesn't care necessarily so much about each commit object per se. It cares about a change as it evolves over time. And so I'm going to go through this rebase dialog and squash this guy upward into the uh, previous commit and then push back up into Garrett. Can you hold on? I can't pause this. <laughs> So, so after pushing that back up, you'll notice that or it's kind of off to the side. There's patch set one and patch set two, and those are two different git commit objects. And if I go back into, into Jenkins, I'll notice, again, off to the side because I'm really good at presentations, that it's, all, it's now succeeded. And Jenkins has marked this change as plus one verified. And then as the developer, because I can't just submit this by myself with Jenkins, someone else needs to come in and say that this is a good change, and I'm going to review this oh, before I take it, or after I take a detour. Forget about this part. So then I've seen that everything's passed. Let's go ahead and click that review button. That's off to the side that you can't see. Believe me, it's there. Oh, man. I did way more than I remembered. It's a very comprehensive screencast. All right. Comment left in there. Now I can give it a plus two and actually go through, hit the sub publish and submit button. And after I hit this button, since Jenkins says this is good and someone has given this a plus two, it's been merged into the repository. And now that change is in the, the version of the master branch that everyone else is kind of building off of. So now that the video is over, what's your question? So why didn't you uh, rebase and uh, squash the Right. So I've gotten in the habit of using rebase a lot because what, I mean, not all of the changes that we have coming through Garrett are this sort of trivial. Um, and so oftentimes I'll be addressing sets of comments in different commits just as, as kind of a local habit. And then I'll have, I'll commit those all as fix ups of the same commit. And then when I go through and I feel comfortable that I've addressed all the code review comments, then I'll squash everything together. Doing the, the amend approach works just as well. This is more 
habit of my own. So when we introduced this, this concept and we switched from subversion to Git, we actually did something different at Lookout that I hadn't done previously, where we introduced them both at the same time. Instead of explaining to people that here's the centralized workflow, the integration manager workflow, the lieutenant's workflow, and all this other nonsense, we introduced the Git and Garrett workflow together and effectively just worked with our developers to say, here's how you do work now, and here's what you can expect, and here are the steps that you go through. There are a lot of people that have worked with Git before, but for anyone that wasn't familiar with Git, we got them up and running in a matter of weeks instead of the, the, the months that it's taken me previously at, at, uh, at other jobs. So cleaning up and making this sort of, or automating the development part of our workflow was long overdue and it was already giving us noticeable improvements as we started to, to put it into place. With every test, or excuse me, with every commit getting tested by Jenkins, our master branch started to become a lot more stable. We, we isolated and removed a lot of the flickering tests and we were looking good to start with sort of the next phase of continuous deployment. And since continuous deployment touches a lot more than just your development team, you've got to start to look at what you can do for the QA team, the operations team, and so there's still a lot more than just this to be done. After getting development sorted and our processes sorted, we needed to automate everything else down, down the line. There's so much more than writing code to get software out the door. I, I think this is a, a good audience preaching to the choir here for that. Take, for example, the deploying of test environments. In the, the olden days of Lookout, what a QA engineer would do is they'd SSH into a machine, they'd run update.sh and pull down some code and some other stuff would happen. Who knows? Like the, the scripts were, were definitely hacked together, but once we started to pull that deployment into Jenkins and get that automated through Jenkins, it made it much easier to start chaining successful test deployments uh, together with other jobs and do things and add a whole new different kind of tests that we could run. One of the things that, that we started to do after we would deploy a test environment is we would chain running Selenium tests off of that. So once a test environment came up, we could just automatically run Selenium smoke tests and start getting feedback reported to the QA team and the developer team about the state of the currently, or the about to be deployed version of code. With the auto automation of development and then the automation of the, the sort of testing of our code squared away, the next big thing to tackle was the automation of our deployment processes themselves. Automating the deployment of production is tricky to do. Um, one of the, the guys from Zero Turnaround said, uh, just sneak it in earlier. Um, it's a little scary to do. Um, I, I don't necessarily recommend that. I totally see where they're coming from, and I've done that before, but it's not always the right decision. Um, to automate the, the deployment of production, though, we started to pick off individual tasks that we could get out to sort of make sure that the sanity of things that were going out was uh, all good. and. We use Capistrano, so we were, it was a lot easier for us to just kind of hook Capistrano into Jenkins, give an, a role account to Jenkins, and give it the necessary permissions to deploy things out into production on its own. So this entire system that we then had going was a developer would do work locally, push to Garrett, test would run, someone would code review, that would get integrated, then someone could deploy to a test environment, say that things were okay, the Selenium tests would check in, and then we could actually start the deployment process and someone could click the button and get a deployment going out the door. And that's, that's kind of a, that's, that's about all we've got going right now. And when you have Jenkins doing all of these things and automating so much, the first thing that you're really gonna need to uh, make sure you've got set up is a lot more slaves and build infrastructure. When we first started moving things into Jenkins, we actually had, I think, three or four slaves in some VMware ESX cluster. And we, when we needed something, uh, or when we needed more capacity, we would just clone slaves and, and, or excuse me, clone VMs from snapshots and try to scale out that way. And it didn't really work out so well. It was, it was pretty difficult to manage. But if you're gonna go towards sort of a continuous deployment workflow, you should keep that in mind with your current build infrastructure because as soon as developers are starting to get blocked by changes being tested from Garrett, 
they're going to want more and more rapid feedback, and that puts a lot more demand on your Jenkins cluster than you probably have now. One of the ways we started to solve this is we've deployed an OpenStack cluster internally. Um, there are a number of reasons we went with OpenStack. Um, you can use EC2 or, or any other virtualization platform for us. We, we decided on OpenStack for a number of reasons. And when we started to invest in OpenStack for, for running a lot of our slaves, once you cross the, the 10 or 11 slave mark, you start to need to really focus on how you're going to manage those slaves. And so as the number of slaves that we operated grew, we started to invest more and more in using Puppet to automate the management of those slaves. So instead of having a, a handcrafted VM before that we might create a new snapshot of when we, ever, when we needed new dependencies, we now just add things into Puppet and we run masterless Puppet internally and all of the slaves will just pull down the new manifests and install the new dependencies as they're needed by the development teams. Time check real quick. Twenty-one. So there's still a lot for us to do. Um, I think we've. I mean, I said we we've done this for about nine months, and we've made a, a huge amount of progress. But nobody's perfect, and I'm more than happy to call out some of the mistakes we've made or some of the things we still need to fix. One of the big things when you start looking at continuous deployment is setting up an automated rollback mechanism becomes more and more important. If you, if you require a sysadmin or an ops guy or a developer to sit and watch a deployment go out to make sure that everything's OK and roll it back if it's not, then every deployment takes a lot more kind of person overhead than it probably should. In order to accomplish this sort of automatic rollback, it'd be really useful if we had production acceptance tests in place. Instead of our current setup where someone needs to manually do a locate or a scream with their phone and kind of exercise the bare minimum of uh, functionality from our applications, having the same acceptance test we might run internally run against the production site can add a really compelling feedback loop to just whenever those acceptance tests fail, roll back automatically. One of the reasons I don't think we have this right now is that tests are really, really slow. If, if anyone here has, has worked with Rails before over time, as, as you build up more and more into a Rails application, tests just seem to get slower and slower and slower. And one of the ways that we've sort of mitigated this problem is the Garrett trigger plugin actually allows for running concurrent jobs. So you can configure multiple jobs to be triggered off of the same event, and the Garrett trigger plugin will fire them all off at the same time. They'll fan out, run on different slaves, and it won't actually mark the change in Garrett as verified or not verified until all of the jobs have completed. And if any of the jobs abort or fail for any reason, it will mark that change as failed. So we can, we can mitigate some of the, the test slowness by kind of leaning on functionality provided by the Garrett trigger plugin, but it's still no excuse for having really slow tests. I think in any sort of environment where you're doing test-driven development, the faster your tests run, the better code you're going to write and the better test that will, will start to come out of it. Um, and this has a lot more to deal with sort of legacy stuff than, than what we've been doing over the past nine months. So we have a lot of these problems. Um, I'm looking forward to fixing these and maybe by, by next year's Jenkins Conf have, have a lot more details on, on how to get to continuous deployment nirvana with Jenkins and some of these other tools. But right now, with introducing the automation of the development process, by using Garrett and Jenkins for kind of pre-tested commits and code review, and by automating that entire pipeline from the kind of commit into the master branch to the deployment of the production site, we've managed to change a lot of the, the sort of culture and the entire engineering organization to where now only 2% of our deployments have failed. And this is a pretty big departure from where we were before. And in those 2% of failed deployments, we've only really got 14 commits to look through. So it's a much smaller haystack to find that, that bug in. And because we only have kind of a small set of, of commits per deployment, we've only ever slipped 3% of our deployments. And currently, we're, we're doing a deployment about every day. And so when we slip a deployment, generally what that means is we just push it tomorrow morning. And ideally, we'd like to be in the, in the 
workflow of just whenever stuff comes into master, it's just on the train out into production. But because tests are slow and there's a lot of other complications there, we haven't quite gotten there yet. And I think I've gone pretty fast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>